Hi, I'm Dr. Hans Toki, and this is another City Insight. Today's topic is Hope for the City. In this session, I'm blending commentary from Jonathan Kozel's book, Fire in the Ashes, Charter Oak State College Urban Youth Students, Eastern University Philanthropy Students, and my own reflections on the topic. But there's so much more than could be said about hope, but this is one reflection of many in a large number of things that have been written about this. Indeed, this word hope, many urban organizations like to toss it around. For example, here in New York City, there's a large charity work that calls itself Hope for New York. We love the positive sense of this word that it brings that people can somehow rise out of negative circumstances that they find themselves in. Suzanne Lickey says, this is the human condition to be hopeful. Lucy Rivera says, hope is more than a word. David Massenberg, hope is about seeing the light in the end of the tunnel. How do we maybe define hope in other ways? While we believe that the American dream says that humans can do anything we put our minds to and we can do it well, as Rivera articulates. If people have hope, it can drive them to rise out of the circumstances they live in. There is this feeling that something good is going to happen. There's a belief in this positive future. Indeed, many faith teachers and gurus have their various populist descriptions of this hope. Possibility thinking, the purpose-filled life, the good life. You can make it, so can I. Some cinnamon, synonyms, not cinnamon, synonyms. Ted, say that 10 times if you can. Optimism, expectation, aspiration, so many other words. Well, Jonathan Kozel in chapter seven of Fire in the Ashes, he demonstrates how hope is derived by youth having others in their lives who believe in their success and that success is possible. Kozel states that they are the children of hope, survivors. They never give up and they never quit. These are the children of hope. These are survivors. The children of St. Anne's are. In the book, he shows how Anne and Leonardo have hope despite being in the inner city. Hope is reflected, for instance, in Anne's parents giving her an opportunity at education. Her parents are willing to relocate in order to help their daughter achieve. There is this move from hopelessness to hopefulness. However, this requires discipline. Ansi, the mother, is this feisty character that was intelligent and self-taught. And she shows this resilience of how urban people, they gain their place in the survival worlds of the street. They learn this resilience. She shows such persistence. This persistence creates an innate desire for her children to rise out of poverty and from hopelessness to hopefulness. Leonardo's story is one that brings a living example of how parents are driven for their kids to achieve and being disciplined, and in doing so can really make a difference in their lives. Leonardo's story shows us how people do not have to be driven to live by the code of the street or how they are here in the city, but they've often learned the code of the street and rise out of it. Intelligence and determination are translated into Leonardo having a happy, structured, and educated life that helps him achieve and go on to college. Again, changing this mindset from hopelessness to hope fullness. Hope creates resilience to overcome the troubled environment. 
This is illustrated in the stories of both Anne and Leonardo and is reflected in the way that both Leonardo's and Anne's parents are driven to the other side of hope. Catherine Kaminsky says it this way, an optimistic attitude shifts to a positive direction that builds perseverance and shifts morals and values. Indeed, there's a change in mindset when one goes from hopelessness to hopefulness, even though in the midst of the current circumstance, it might seem hopeless, but I'm hopeful. Love is benevolence and giving of oneself to the other. Benevolence is a driving force in creating hope. The hope that comes from giving help cannot be underestimated among urban youth and in the inner city. Charity is more than just a simple word of philanthropy. Benevolence gives the idea of benefiting someone else at the expense of oneself. We see this in Ansi and in the way she gives herself to the other, mother to daughter. Let's define then philanthropy of this giving. It comes from two Greek words. One, philia, for love. The other, anthropos, human. So love connects with human. So the philanthropist is one who loves humanity. The typical dictionary description is this the desire to promote the welfare of others, especially by generations, uh, do, uh, generous donations of money. I think it goes a lot beyond money. So let's take a connected word to philanthropy. And this is benevolence or beneficence. Defining beneficence is the action that is done for the benefit of others to help prevent or remove harms or to simply improve the situation of others. Benevolence, its partner, the morally valuable character trait or virtue of being disposed to act to benefit others. So the benevolent or beneficent person is an altruist, is compassionate, is generous, gives gifts, has goodness, is kind-hearted, is kind, and is sympathetic. It's not a person who has animosity, is greedy, is mean, is selfish, is spiteful, or unkind. You can see how philanthropy and beneficence and benevolence are the antithesis of some of the characteristics we see in the troubled inner city, but also among many of us, really. There is this continuum of beneficence ethics. It moves from obligatory to subrogatory to saintly or heroic. The obligatory is the one who does what I have to do. I have to pay my taxes. I have to give at the office. I have to do my duty. The supererogatory is I do more than this necessary and I give money beyond the core of what I really have to. I might participate in a run somewhere. Or I might uh, give at uh, some special event or attend a dinner. Many of us probably at some stage of our lives fit this supererogatory idea of beneficence. Then there's the saintly or the heroic. That's the one who gives of their life to the service of others. The ultimate form of this is martyrdom. Historically, the religious martyrs, or now we have uh, military martyrs who give their lives. And of course, here in New York, 9-11 brings us the fire department people who give their lives. Just this week, firefighter passed away in a saintly, heroic way, trying to save uh, people in a, in a burning home. So in our society, we expect obligatory ethics. Yes, everybody has equality and concern for each other. 
Uh, we expect a little bit to be taken care of of the oppressed. But this comes into conflict with the idea of individual consumption and orientation that everything is for myself. I do things for me. So at the extreme of saintly, I completely reverse the individualistic to be completely beneficent to someone else. We see this in the illustrations in the book, but also in society. The Jewish Shema lays it out this way that we create a shalom or a symmetrical life of well-being where the heart, soul, mind, strength, and neighbor are all blended together. The heart is spiritual, soul the emotional, mind the intellectual, strength the physical, uh, neighbor the community. The symmetrical life of well-being. I benefit others to create peace. It's more than just not fighting. It's this whole orchestrated life. The Christian application of Shema, care for the widow, the orphan, the foreigners, uh, the supererogatory giving of my houses and my homes, the obligatory that I have to give a tithe or an offering at a meeting, or I am heroic in giving of my life. Indeed, a Christian would say that Jesus is the one of heroic beneficence. Buddhist philanthropy brings this concept to the quest to end human suffering and a quest for compassion. So for some of us, this is not a, pro a practical uh, application into some obligatory frame or cre free creed but really it's a subjective aesthetic of being a compassionate person. So I don't just do it out of duty, I do it because I am. So the Buddhist ethical life is this philanthropic frame of being for the other. The Dharma uh, in Hinduism brings us that suffering is universal. Suffering as opposed to pain exists because of our attachments to greed and self-centeredness and, and selfishness. So if suffering is universal, then I'm selfish. Our egocentric attitude, our possessiveness, our greed can be overcome and it can be rooted out. So the Dharma says we root it out and we accomplish this by following the simple, reasonable, eightfold path of behavior of thought in word and deed, which really is creating a sense of otherness, that I'm beneficent, I'm philanthropic, I'm giving to the other. Well, how does this apply to you and I, this great lesson that we see in the inner city families that give to their kids to rise out from hopelessness to hopefulness? While it is compassion and action together, so the Buddhist would say, compassion without practical action is a negative result. It's pointless. But the Buddhist-oriented other person has a giving lifestyle to alleviate suffering to the positive result. To a Jewish person, this is giving alms to the other. Indeed, cash gifts. In some of our uh, uh, Muslim temples, there will be a, a cash box where you give cash at the back without any name tax, no tax receipt, no nothing. Why? Because it's best to give of our wealth just simply as an action of compassion. And so in all these different religious philosophical beliefs, there is this idea that hope comes from compassion an action. It's not just this guru idea of possibility thinking or living this purposeful life for myself. In this selfish world where people keep things for themselves, the stories of the inner city of hope for charity and love drive us to become a motor motivator for the rest of us. The devotion of a love of a son or daughter from a parent who's a survivor of the street is this powerful way that grows out of the culture of poverty. And hope then is reflected in the lives of urban youth because why? 
the support from others like you and I who believe they can succeed. Damien Broomfield says this. Literally, he says, hope is reflected in the lives of urban youth because of the hope they receive from others who care and believe they can succeed. Do you get that? Damien is articulating here, hope comes from what? Others who believe in me. We've heard this a lot, but do we apply it? In conclusion, we need to move from lamenting the poor to celebrating the achievement and resilience of the poor. Indeed, the power of life change that comes from the discipline we see in the city is truly a remarkable thing. Jennifer Tillman says, hope is only a four letter word, but it is quite mighty. Without hope, many people would not be able to flourish in a world where it's hard to succeed. This is, folks, a direct call to mentors, teachers, workers, philanthropists to commit their lives to build hope into the hopeless. It is such a painful journey sometimes in working with urban youth, but simultaneously such a joyful one. It is this dichotomy of joy and pain working at the same time. In the same day, we can see pain and joy. Such is the life of an urban worker and a public school teacher and a college professor too. We need to be changing the mindset of ourselves and from those we work with, from hopelessness to hopefulness. We all need to be beacons. We need to be the beacons of hope to those in need. Helping people to move from helplessness to hopefulness. I'm Dr. Hans Toki, and this has been another City Insight. I'll see you next time.